welcome attendees to International House at the University of Chicago and African Community Fund for Education's fourth annual Girls Education Conference, Girls Education in a Digital World. My name is Denise Jorgens and I'm the director of International House here at the University of Chicago. Today's program is one of over 100 programs held at International House of Chicago as a part of our Global Voices Performing Arts and Lecture Series. Whether it's a music or dance performance, a film festival, cultural or national celebration, International House presents programs that advance cross-cultural understanding and promote civic discourse on community, national, and world affairs. Next year, International House of Chicago will celebrate an important milestone, our 90th anniversary. From the day International House opened its doors in 1932, our mission has been to promote cross-cultural understanding and mutual respect among students and scholars and on the part of the people of metropolitan Chicago toward individuals of all nations and backgrounds. To, through the International House Student Life Experience and our internationally focused public programs, International House is dedicated to transforming people's lives for a better world. This mission is further extended through the work of the International House's worldwide organization, which is currently a network of 15 houses on four continents. We invite you to join us here at International House throughout the coming year for many of our other Global Voices Performing Arts and Lecture programs, many of which are live streamed or recorded for later viewing. So as a part of today's program, we are going to hear from our friend and partner, Stanley Nadembakua, who is the president and CEO of the African Community Fund for Education, to learn more about their important work. But first, let's take a look at what we'll experience during today's event. First, a keynote presentation by Esther Wojcicki, American educator and journalist at Global Moonshots in Education on why empowering girls matters for the world. And this will be followed by an interactive audience Q&A. Following uh, this presentation, we will have a panel discussion featuring Marangawa Makamato, board chairperson ACFE Group, Organizational Transformation Architect and Strategy Consultant. Joined by Jen Clark, Executive Director, One Two World, Shelly Davis, President and CEO, Coleman Foundation, Amy Maglio, Executive Director, Women's Global Education Project, and Adrian Coleman, Director of Equity and Inclusion at the Illinois Math and Science Academy, IMSA. This panel will be moderated by Shelley Bromberic Lambert, Chief Reimagination Officer at YMCA Metropolitan Chicago. You'll also have the chance to participate in a Q&A with our panelists following their discussion. And finally, throughout the event, we'll hear about several experiences, including <laughs> videos from Women's Global Education Project, YMCA Metropolitan Chicago, and African Community Fund for Education programs to learn more about their experiences and the role that education has played in shaping their beneficiaries. I'd like to take this time to appreciate our sponsors and partners, the Center for Global Health and the YWCA Metropolitan Chicago. And now please join me in welcoming African Community Fund for Education President and CEO, Stanley 
who I'm also going to take this opportunity to um, welcome as a 2022-2023 International House Fellow. We can't wait to welcome you back to Chicago, Stanley. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dennis, for such a great introduction to our fourth annual Girls Education Conference. Um, over the past few years, we have seen how a genuine commitment to girls' education can yield results. Whether you have supported a girl child into school, made your voice heard at one of our previous conferences, or wrote an article about girls' education in your community, you inspired girls to stand strong against the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, our conversation under the theme, Girls' Education in a Digital World, responds to our experiences with technology during the COVID-19 pandemic and how it enabled or prevented girls from learning. But we'll also share lessons learned and how our organizations led and supported the education of girls. The ACFE works to create opportunities of access to education for girls through our education leadership programs. That's why we continue to strengthen our partnerships with Chicago to change the lives of girls who cannot otherwise go to school if no one helps them. I would like to share a, a video with you from one of my friends, Amy McLeal, and the Women's Global Education Project to highlight some of the challenges facing girls. Um, Jocelyn, you can play uh, a video from the Women's Global Education Project. Dare na mianke komi neri. Kakari, uto. Kera muto na rudi rebu, soso wa kwa na chore ba kwa bonde. Inda gudo kana arega koro dabu inka umbu. Dare muare we komi na bana uta anwa intugu eni. Kolodere <laughs> Kurega <laughs> My life is very different from my mother's. I am the first woman from our village to go to a university. If it was not my mom's courage, I would not be where I am today. So the rest of our morning will be spent hearing from experts on their experiences and what their organizations are doing. I'd like to bring up Shelley Bromblech Lambert of YWCA Metropolitan Chicago to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you, Stanley. 
I have the pleasure of introducing Esther Wojcicki. She is going to talk to us this morning. She is an American educator and journalist. She works at Global Moonshots for Education, and she is the vice chair of Creative Commons Advisory Council. Esther has studied education and technology. She is the founder of Palo Alto High School in Media Arts Program in California. She is the co-founder of Track Learning Inc. that published a website that has peer-to-peer project-based gamification learning platform for children eight years and over. Today, Esther is going to speak to us in why empowering girls matters for the world. Welcome, Esther. Thank you so much for including me. I'm very honored and happy to be here. And um, one of my passions in the world is improving girls' education. So I will show you my uh, presentation now, hopefully, um, and then we can get started on the desktop. Here we go. So I'm gonna be talking to you about why girls' education matters. And I'm telling you, it matters a lot. Um, and uh, let's see, sorry, I'm gonna to have to reduce this a little bit. So here is um, one of the most important things for everyone to realize is that our world is having a lot of problems today. And I don't think you have to look very far to see that. But um, a lot of people, they have a myopic view of it and they don't realize how impactful it would be. But the idea is to, when you educate a girl, you're changing the world. Imagine if the world, if 600 million girls unlocked their power, 600 million girls. We talk about girls that are all over the world that are not educated. It's really a shocking situation. So educating girls will be our most powerful force for global change in the 21st century. And it's great that the University of Chicago is doing this and that there's a lot of people behind it. But <clears throat> educated girls are healthier citizens. That's one of the first things. And they raise healthier families. So in the first video that Stanley showed, you see that that girl talked about the power of her mother. Her mother made the difference. So if all girls can have a mother like that, then the world will already be better. So also, educated girls are less likely to marry young or to contract HIV and more likely to have healthy, educated children. Right now, girls in the world's most vulnerable communities are not able to access quality education and distance learning opportunities which is really a shame because they can access them all over the developed world. Why can't they access them all over the world? There's internet everywhere. Everybody's got a phone. So unfortunately, the COVID pandemic is disproportionately affecting these girls and young women now and for years to come. The world wasn't working before 2020 and is definitely not working now. 25 years of progress made with vaccines have been lost in just 25 weeks due to COVID. 25 years of progress. Here's another one. 47 million girls and women could lose access to contraceptives because of the pandemic. I mean, the world, the, the pandemic is not just in killing people. It's impacting those of us that are still here. So here's the situation. Billions of dollars have been invested in services for girls from health to education to entrepreneurship. These are services that they need, yet millions of girls are still not using them, even when they're free. This is the reason why. Girls do not see the services as being for them. They think they're made for someone else. From this about vaccines to only bad girls use phones, and the messages girls receive from society stand in the way. Every girl has an opinion about what girls should do. So this is a company that I'm working with and it's called Girl Effect. 
What they do is they serve girls by listening to girls. This is a digital way for girls to be supported. They build a bridge. They connect girls on one side of the services that help them on the other side with partners. And they create content for girls that they seem to relate and love. So Girl Effect is a group that I'm supporting. This is one solution, but there are many solutions. But this is a very effective solution, so I recommend it strongly. The solution is, of course, education access for all girls. Why? When you give all students some control of the learning, they are able to shape the future. And this Presidential Medal of Freedom Award winner said the only way to predict the future is to have the power to shape it. So we need to give girls some opportunity to shape their future. When students have some control, they're engaged. So this, I'm just drawing from my classes. I, a teacher at Palo Alto High School, it's the largest media program in the United States. And I published this book in 2015, Moonshots in Education. And then I have a foundation called Global Moonshots in Education. In 2020, I published another book called How to Raise Successful People, published today in 27 languages. And what I'm trying to do is to raise successful people worldwide. And girls are, of course, number one in my, uh, number one in changing the world. Just this is a very quick introduction to the course, to the book that I have. And this is the acronym that I developed. It's called TRIC. And it stands for Trust, Respect, Independence, Collaboration, and Kindness. So my philosophy is trust your children, respect their ideas, give them more independence than they get right now, collaborate instead of dictating, and treat them with kindness. And this is the philosophy I use with my own children and in my classroom. And it worked. So today's information sources are all of these tablets, computers, and iPhones or regular or, um, Android phones. And there are more phones in the world today than human beings. So everybody in the world probably has a phone. And independent learning empowers the learner. So when they feel like they can go online and find information that matters to them, they feel empowered. So what I'm trying to do is encourage teachers to give students some control of their learning. When they go to school, instead of just always telling them what to do, give them an opportunity to collaborate. Get to give them an opportunity to work in groups. Give them an opportunity to find some of this information that, they, that matters online. How about giving them 20% of the time? I realize mm -hmm. that you know schools, wherever they are in the world, like to be very uh, top-down, teacher-controlled. But if we can just give students 20% of the time to work on projects they care about, you'll engage them. So this is an example of, again, my class. And this is what happens in my class. It's a very different type of learning than you have in most schools. It's all student-run. And, of course, we're really lucky to have a great facility like this. And um, students work independently. And the girl that's sitting on the chair is the one that's actually in charge in this particular case. Notice it's a young student and not the teacher. I oversee the whole program, but I give students an opportunity to develop their own leadership skills. If you came into the class, you would see them working like this in groups because that's where they do the learning, when they work together in groups and not when they're lectured to. No one likes to sit there and listen to lectures for seven hours a day. Um, even if, you know, that, that's unfortunately not learning. That's listening, and listening doesn't transfer to learning. This is another picture of the kids working. And this is, as you can see, it, the classes are very big. It doesn't matter that they're big as long as they work in groups. So this is the kind of work that the students produce. And this looks like it's produced by professionals. It's produced by students because these projects are projects that they own 
and they care about. And these are just more examples of the publications. These are 28 pages long. This is the front page of the publication. They have a website. This is the website. Um, this is more information about the website. Uh, the, they have magazines, several magazines. One of them is called the C Magazine. And this is more information about the C Magazine. Then there's another magazine called Verdi. There's 10 magazines. So I'm only going to show you a few of them. This is a Verdi website. But what this does is empowers the students. They go out in the world and say to themselves, I can do it. And they can. And um, this is a magazine on um, student on foreign affairs that the students run. And this is a photography magazine. This is uh, the website. This is we have television. And this is an example of a few of the graduates. These are people that achieved their dreams by doing what mattered to them. This is Jeremy Lin, who's a basketball player. Uh, Jonathan Yi, he's a filmmaker. This is Gotti Epstein, he's the economist reporter for China. Liz Gaines, she's a senior editor for Recode. This is James Andrews, he's a um, social media. These are just a few of my students. There are thousands of them. <clears throat> this young man is the New York Times reporter in the Ukraine. This is James Franco, who was also my student, an actor. And uh, we need to empower students with these 21st century skills so they can control their future. We need to give them the opportunity to work independently. So what I have started in this pandemic is a program called Tract, where you give kids control of their learning. And it's the place for kids to be creative and it's online, it's free, doesn't cost anything, can be used anywhere in the world, it's in English only. And all kids want to be creative, but they're afraid. So we are trying to help them be creative, they just have to log on. And we use our, our kids 8 to 13, and the creators are kids 13 to 25. So we have peer-to-peer -peer creation, actually, what we're doing is having older kids, 13 to 25, create learning for kids under that age. It's all project-based, practical, that meets kids where they are. And we have a guide for students. They started, this is the creators. They are beginners and intermediates and advanced. And the idea is to support them. So we support them. We teach them how to make videos. We teach them how to talk about what matters to them. And then we help them publish their information. It's project-based. And the CEO of the company is that young man at the bottom down there. He's my former student. So he knows what it was that made Tract important and project-based learning important for him. So these are some of the examples, activists, gamers, chefs, artists, musicians. These are all um, people that are involved, but you don't have to be a gamer or a chef or an artist. You can be just you, just a student wanting to share your information. This is what it looks like when you go on there. It's peer to peer. All of these are made by kids. They're all made by kids, like I said, 13 or some of them even 12 and above. Here's another example. So you can see they have track and field, psychology. There, there are thousands of these. I just randomly picked any for you just to take a look at. So tracked can empower all students. Um, they can learn to be creators. They learn leadership skills. They learn to collaborate with their peers. Um, it's educational because it's tied to the Common Core State Standards. It's fun. Kids love it. They love it as well, much as they love YouTube or TikTok. They learn tech skills. It's easy to use, and it empowers all students. So teachers can sign up for it easily. Um, you just go to teach.track.app and you can sign up for it. It doesn't cost anything. You can put in all your students. If there's 25, 50, 100, doesn't matter. 
they all get access to it. <clears throat> so Malala is somebody I just spent the last week with her. And she says, we need to encourage girls that their voice matters. I think there are hundreds and thousands of Malalas out there and they're afraid to speak out. So we need to encourage them and allow them to speak out. So the Malala Fund is working for a world where every girl can learn and lead, malala.org. Here's also a podcast for girls that I recommend, Girl Gone Viral. So thank you for your attention. If anyone needs more information, you could contact Emily <clears throat> at tract.app. So thank you very much. Thanks, Esther. If anybody has questions for um, Esther, please put them in the Q and A. But um, I, I'll I'll kick us off. So first of all, Esther, you have like an impressive resume of former students. So that speaks to um, the the work that you do as an educator. Um, just really creative and and really impressive um, young people. You talked a lot about um, really fostering that creativity, the ability to, for students to elevate their voice. Can you share with us, um, you gave us some great tools and links and people are wanting them in there, but how do you um, really make sure that you fight for the educational environment that you know is so important, that is led by students, that is hands-on. If you, for some of our um, educators who might get resistance from their administration of the schools they work with, what recommendations do you have for them in helping to really advocate for what we know to be best for student learning? Well, that's a great question. And just so you know, I've been teaching for 40 years. And it was a huge battle, um, you know, because the, the education system puts the teacher at the center of the class and that teacher bosses the kids around all day, every class. So that can be seven hours a day. So when I started doing that, when I started giving kids control, I got into pro trouble. Um, and so I can see that for other teachers in other schools around the world. And so what I just want to say to them is what you need to do is talk to your administration and explain to them that we all know, all the educational research tells you today that in fact, that project-based learning is the most effective way to go, the most effective. And so that's why I say just do it 20% of the time, just 20 80%, you can still tell them what to do all the time. And, but 20% of the time, they can use Tract, for example. That's why I created Tract, because it was a battle for me, and I was hoping it wouldn't be such a battle for them. So they can just say, well, I want to use this program in my schools or my classes, and, you know, kids learn independently, and they create their own learning. And so that's really a good thing. Um, that's what I would advise because I know there will be resistance because they'll say, what are you doing telling those kids that they can, you know, speak or publish things that they think? Thanks for that, Esther. We we so appreciate um, you sharing with us today um, all of your knowledge. And I know several people have asked to um, put the links, if we can, into the chat because you shared such great resources um, with us today. And so we so, um, so appreciate that. And I'll turn it back to Stanley. Okay, so we are going to move into our panel discussion that will be moderated by Shelley Bromberg Lambert. Um, I'm going to give a brief introduction about Shelley. Uh, Shelley has, has spent over 30 years in education and community service, helping to solve complex problems and enhance young lives. 
She has a track record for practical and effective strategies that leverage organizations, organizations' number one asset, their people. Shell is guided by organization, organizational mission and vision, adept at translating those principles um, into plans and actions that strengthen and deepen impact. Shelly joined the YWCA Metropolitan Chicago in 2015 as the Chief Reimagination Officer, which um, she was tasked with reimagining what the child care field could be. Uh, she has reshaped the YWCA's approach to early childhood and youth services with a comprehensive approach focused on four distinct stake stakeholders, child care providers, educators, children, and families. Under Shelley's leadership, the YWCA Metropolitan Chicago's Early Childhood and Youth Division grew from $2 million in 2015 to now um, at $25 million. Uh, that is in 2022. I'd like to introduce Shelley to take um, over from here and uh, lead the panel discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Stanley. And I have just a phenomenal um, panel of um, panelists today that I'm just very excited um, for and, and love uh, this part of our education conference every year. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panelists, and then we're going to get into um, asking some questions. And then if you have questions um, throughout the conversation, please put them in the Q&A, and we'll, get to, we'll try to save some time at the end to get to them. Our first panelist is... Um, Marunwa Makamato, and she is the board chair for ACFE. She also is an organizational transformation architect and strategic consultant. She has her MBA, and she has over 20 years of solid experience, both locally and internationally, with blue chip corporate public sector um, organizations. She is a highly regarded expert on topics relating to the development of business strategies, as well as the implementation of change management, performance management, and effective human resource management strategies. So welcome to our panel. Our next panelist is Jen Clark. She is the executive director of one Two world Jen has more than 20 years of experience in international affairs, education, fundraising, and a lifelong passion of promoting global economic justice and cross-cultural understanding. From her experience as a volunteer in Zimbabwe to her work in communications policy and project management at the Canadian International Development Agency. Jen's career has required her to travel throughout the world, including managing projects on development in Zimbabwe and Ghana. She holds her bachelor's in journalism and a double major in political science. She has her master in geography. So welcome to our panel, Jen. Our next panelist is Shelly Davis. She is the president and CEO of the Coleman Foundation. She has dedicated her career to the sectors of nonprofit and philanthropic um, giving and is a lifelong Chicago South Sider who grew up in South Shore neighborhood. In her early career, she, was pro she provided crisis intervention counseling and was a policy advocate. She began working in the philanthropic space during her graduate school at the University of Illinois, Chicago, with a fellowship with the Field Foundation. It was her work at the Ford Foundation and the Joyce Foundation that guided her development as a grant maker. And I love the way she describes, it instilled in her a deep appreciation for the privilege and responsibility of moving resources to benefit communities. Welcome, Shelly, to our panel. And our next um, panelist is Amy Meglio. She is the Executive Director of Women's Global Education Project that was started in 2004. For the past 15 years, she's worked closely with grassroots community partners to educate, empower, and promote equality for women and girls in rural Senegal and Kenya. In 2010, Amy was invited to present their model as a best practice approach to girls' education at the United Nations Girls' Education Initiative Conference. She was also the director of the UN Declaration of Gender Equality. Amy holds a master's degree from the School of International Service at the American University in DC. Welcome, Amy. And last but certainly not least is Dr. Adrienne Coleman. 
She is the Director of Equity and Inclusion at Illinois Mathematic and Science Academy, which is a residential high school for students who are gifted and talented in mathematics and science. In a role, she is responsible for assessing potential barriers and developing strategies focused on recruiting and retaining a diverse community, as well as implementation of their equity and excellence plan. She has been promoting diversity and equity and inclusion for multiple institutions, for educational institutions, social service organizations, law enforcement, and government organizations for 20 years. She's a researcher, and we're going to talk to her today about some of her research as well. Welcome, Adrian. So I'm going to go ahead. If everybody wants to go ahead and put their cameras on, and we'll begin the we'll begin the panel. And um, I feel, as I said, so honored to be here with um, this amazing group of uh, women. So, Amy, I'm going to start with you. Can you just share with us to kick us off where your passion for education came from? Sure. Well, thanks, Shelley, for, for the introduction and, and for, to the Interna International House for having me. Um, my passion for girls' education really came from my experience as a Peace Corps volunteer. Um, back in my 20s, a, a while ago now, um, much to my parents' dismay, I joined the Peace Corps and I was sent to Senegal, West Africa. Um, I lived in a, a, a rural village in a mud hut um, with no running water and no electricity for almost three years. And I lived in a family compound. And the eldest daughter in that family had never gone to school before. Um, she was about nine when I got there and 11 when I was leaving Senegal. And I helped her go to school for the first time. And from that experience, you know, I saw firsthand uh, the impact that going to school could have on a girl's confidence and on her future. Um, I really thought that it was unfair. I, I just saw so many girls that I knew personally uh, not going to school, uh, not able to pick up a book and read. But it wasn't just that. It was that they didn't seem to be able to make that choice on their own. Someone had decided that for them. Um, from what I could see, it made people feel left out, disregarded, worthless. Um, they were excluded and told that they couldn't uh, go to school or try, uh, even before they had this, this chance. So it, it didn't, didn't seem very fair to me. <laughs> uh, so it was this feeling of injustice um, that led me to start Women's Global Education Project, um, just from the little support that I could provide my Senegalese host sister, Hadi. Um, she excelled. She learned to read and to write. Her confidence filled. I was so inspired by this that I decided to start an organization dedicated to helping women and girls get the education and training that they need um, to decide for themselves their own future. So I think it's almost 18 years ago now, around my dining room table, I started Women's Global. In our first year, we helped 10 girls get into school for the first time. Fast forward to today, our programs have reached over 20,000 women and girls and 35,000 individuals in 130 um, villages in Senegal and Kenya. Um, so this is this is something personal, um, and I've been I've been plugging away for for the past eighteen years. What a great story! Not only did you change Hattie's life, but it sounds like she changed yours and the trajectory of you know where you were going to go. So wonderful story, Adrian. As an educator, I'd love to hear from you. What set you on your track to have this this passion for education? Well, um, what I try to tell people is that I didn't necessarily choose education. Education chose me, and I've embraced it um, since it decided that that was the path for me. I, I previously worked at Rutgers University, um, and I have, a, I have a background in public health. And so I was working at Rutgers in our health services. And when I get there, as part of my job, they said, well, you also need to teach. And I said, teach? Well, I'm not, I'm not a teacher. I'm a, I'm a health educator. You know, um, I, I focus on looking at um, health disparities. And they um, said they wanted me to teach a health and social justice course. Well, that started my path not only in education, but also in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And the more I learned, um, I began to understand 
all of the inequities that lie within the educational system. And I wanted to change the narrative. I wanted to bring educational equity to everyone, um, especially for Black and Latino students. And so um, that began my path, you know, starting a job and them wanting me to teach this course and learning about inequities that exist. And now I work towards advancing educational equity every single day. Thanks for sharing that. Jen, can you share with us a little bit about how did you um, really have that passion for education and where, where did it begin? Well, I'm, um, thank you very much, Shelley. And uh, I also would like to thank International House and the African Community Fund for Education for this, this opportunity today. Um, I was very fortunate. I, I have always been a very curious person and I loved education. I, I was one of those people who could, um, you know, I benefited from the traditional education system when I was growing up. Um, and I uh, later came to realize that not everyone did and that uh, not every uh, person benefited from uh, the same opportunities that I had when I was a kid. Um, the passion for education, I mean, it, it, to me, I wanted everyone to be as excited and, and, and joyful about learning um, and expanding their horizons as I was growing up. And so I had different opportunities throughout my career to um, work in that area. But I think as I started to uh, work overseas um, and learn about the situation with um, young girls in other countries, um, it became even more important um, to focus on, on, on young women um, in this area. So um, fast forward to where I am today. And I think expanding people's perceptions, because I lived in a bit of a bubble when I was growing up and didn't see what was going on around the, the rest of the world. Um, we've worked to do that today with young people, expanding their view and, and their vision of what's going on around the world and expanding what uh, their, their vision for who they can be in the future. Um, so I think uh, with our, I'll talk a little bit more later in the panel about our global classroom program and how we work in that, in that area. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, to me, it's always been part of my passion and uh, everywhere I go, I, I try to share that passion with other people and find and support ways um, to uh, bring what works for them to them. So, Thanks, Jen. When you talk about um, growing up in a little bit of a bubble, I was I had um, a similar experience and I, I always really am thankful for my guidance counselor in high school who really pushed me to go to school. I was the first um, person in my extended family to go to college and that was just life changing. My bubble was expanded significantly in the experience and I think was really um, instrumental in shaping me. So thanks for sharing that story. Shelly, we're going to pivot a little bit. I'd love to hear about... Um, it sounds like you've had such great mentors um, in, in your um, career. Um, you talk a little bit in your bio about some of the foundations you work and how they really set you on a strong mentorship. Can you talk to me about some of those first mentors in your life and what lessons you've taken um, with you um, in your career? Yeah. Um, well, and good morning, everyone. So happy to be here. And, and I do want to give a shout out to my mentors, but before I should talk about my mother for one second. So my mother was the middle of three daughters. All three went to women's college, which is a historically black college, Bennett College, which is in North Carolina. And they were all three trained as teachers. So we talk about foundations of education. I had no choice but to, but to love education. My mother is a librarian by training and taught in private schools as well as Chicago public schools throughout her career. Um, so mentorship, mentorship, of course, is, is, has been, I think it's critical for anybody, but especially uh, for me, um, it has been, um, it has been key at every stage, every decision I've made throughout my career. And I will just talk about one mentor, her, her name was um, Wanda White, and some of you may have known her, she passed away quite a few years ago from breast cancer, uh, unfortunately. Um, but she, um, she was introduced to me. So I, my career began in the domestic violence movement. So I did crisis intervention and counseling for women and their families, and then moved into uh, working more on women's economic empowerment at Chicago Women in Trades and really worked on public policy and equal pay issues for years. Um, 
while I, when I started working in public policy, shifting from um, direct service, my supervisor at the time suggested that one of the ways that she could help with professional development was to introduce me to a mentor. And so she introduced me to Wanda White. So it was really a matching of a mentor, not something that came out organically. And we, she was a mentor to me for the rest of her life. Um, and so I would sit with Wanda sometimes every other month, sometimes quarterly. Once we got closer, I would just walk to her house. We actually don't live that far away, didn't live that far away from each other. And sometimes it was just about listening. And sometimes it was about me having some very specific questions. And when I was deciding um, to leave my role, to then go to grad school full time, it was really Wanda's help and influence to help me think through how to plan my graduate school education, how to build mentorships there, and how to think through how I navigated my career that really my edu- my graduate school career that really focused on community economic development. I'll stop there. That's great. Everybody sounds like they need a wand in their in their life and when they're starting out on their career. So thanks for sharing that. Marunwa, I would love to hear from you um, the same question about who have been some of the mentors in your life and um, what have you, what experiences have you brought forward in your life because of them? I think you might still be on mute, Marunwa. Yes, yeah, good afternoon, um, everybody. Um, it is an honor for me to be part of this conference. Um, you know, I grew up in a, a, a big family of eight, uh, four brothers and four sisters with a non-present father. And my mother was everything. And as I grew up, I started looking up to the women um, in the area where I grew up in. And I, I got uh, mentored by uh, some of the ladies who were teachers in, I'll, I'll call it a township, not more than, not so much as a village, but as a township. And um, in our area, there were a lot of ladies who were actually teachers. And actually that is where I developed the passion to teach. But my passion was more fueled and driven by the poverty in which I grew up, but also uh, due to the uh, low socioeconomic environment, but also due to the family environment, which were so uh, inequitable, specifically where uh, fathers are not in existence and the mothers are the ones who are carrying the torch to make sure that their children not only get something to eat, but also are able to go to school and uh, get an education. And then as I grew up, uh, I managed to go to university, you know, um, when I tell the story of how I went to university is a long story, so I'll leave that for another day, uh, but it was through the sweat um, of my mom and us asking, um, you know, some local businessmen to assist with uh, my funding of the university studies. But um, when I went to university, I started to look up to the ladies who, for example, were in senior positions in lectureship um, in the institution. And those were the people that inspired me to become better at what I, I, I was doing and also to aspire towards greatness and also to show other girl children that they can actually become who they want to become if they put their mind to it. And this- Marunwa, I think you hit your I think you hit your mute button again. There. And my my apologies. So it, it is indeed um when when uh, Stanley approached me to come and assist him to run the uh, ACEF, I, I jumped at that opportunity because I saw this as an opportunity for me to give back, particularly to the girl child, um, in terms of whatever that I can impart, be it monetary, uh, be it uh, mentoring, be it leadership, be it training, be it um, whatever that I could actually uh, provide as part of my support in terms of improving the life of a girl child, uh, not only in South Africa, but in Zimbabwe as well. I'll stop there. That's, that's great. Um, so so appreciate you sharing that. And it sounds like you had a real champion in your mom um, to, to help you, uh, set you on the course. And, and very, it sounds like she was um, very focused on getting you into school and, and um, what a great champion there. 
So Jen, I'd like to go back to you. Um, can you share with us a little bit, you talked about in your opening remarks about um, One Two World and some of the work that you um, that they do. And can you talk to us a little bit about um, the program at One Two World and how um, I, I'm, I'm interested in how you, the program at One Two World helps to create understanding and build that positive relationship. Um, between area residents and your students. I think that that's so powerful in today's area um, and world where there's, you know, some people are becoming more siloed and it going retreating to their bubbles. So I'd love to hear about your work, Jen. Sure. Thank you, Shelley. Um, I'll give you a kind of an overview of the organization, but I do want to speak specifically about one um, that pertains particularly to what we're talking about today. But one to world has been around for about 45 years, and we work to um, integrate and, uh, and, and uh, engage international students that are studying in the area. So there's almost 100,000 international students that come to study in the New York tri-state area every year from all over the world. Um, about 120 to 140 countries are represented. They're here to study, but the education is just one piece of the puzzle. And so we bring them off their campuses and get them into the community. We get them to meet local residents and Americans. Um, and they have a much richer experience being able to share their own cultures with local residents, um, as well as the residents sharing the, um, th their cultures with the visitors. Um, what this does is kind of break down some barriers, assumptions, biases, um, we found we've, we have some terrific stories about um, even the international students amongst themselves having their barriers kind of broken down. Um, just recently, actually, we had an Indian scholar that was here studying music, uh, and he met a Pakistani uh, scholar, and he said that he had never actually sat down and had a meal with a Pakistani before, uh, and that he had been taught to actually hate them. And this, we had given them the opportunity to come together um, uh, with a face-to-face -face experience, and we find that this happens quite, um, quite a lot. Um, our Global Classroom Program is one of our flagship programs, and what we do is we, we train the international students that are here. They volunteer their time to come into the classrooms in uh, New York City, K through 12, and we work with uh, um, the public schools here in the area, most, many of which are um, under-resourced, and they come into the classrooms and share their stories. And so they share their cultures, uh, we work around themes, and one of our important themes is girls and women's lives. And so these, these young women from all over the world come into the classroom and share what girls and women's lives are like in their home country. Uh, this touches on all kinds of different issues. Um, we've had um, conversations about um, the education, obviously, in the other countries, uh, some of the, the, the um, issues that they have, such as the female genital mutilation that was mentioned earlier in the program. Um, and it really kind of, it's an opportunity for the girls to learn what um, others are doing around the world. It's also empowering for them and inspiring because they see these women who are traveling the world uh, and representing their countries and they, they kind of take on that kind of, um, they're inspired by what they're seeing to maybe think about themselves in that place. Um, we also bring it back locally though. So we're talking about global issues we bring it back to their community. And so they have an opportunity to look around to some of the issues that, are, that they face in their community um, and kind of bring attention to it. For example, we had a recent project where the girls were learning about um, homelessness. And so they wanted to do a campaign about the challenges of women in shelters in their community. And so they did a, um, a publicity campaign and they put up posters and they, um, did some uh, fundraising and collected needs and supplies that women need in the shelters and are often short of. So they do, they, they learn about global issues, but they bring it back locally in their community. So it's, uh, um, we, do, we put on over a hundred programs every year uh, that have these, these opportunities to share and learn from each other. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a great, um, it, it, I feel terrific about doing it. And uh, I think there's, there's, people who participate in our programs can't help but be changed by them, so. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I think I, I was not um, familiar with Wonder World until um, I met you on the panel, but I just am really um, impressed with the way the programming from, a, you know, when I was doing some research, just the ability to meet when you put a name to a person and you put, they become a person. They're not in a group. They're not some character we might have of them. And I think that this is just powerful work um, with learning from one another. And I love the way you've structured it. So thanks for sharing that with them, um, with everybody today. Um, 
Shelly, I'd like to talk a little bit um, about, uh, I know that the Coleman Foundation um, focuses on supporting community-based organizations. And I also know that one of the areas that you focus on is entrepreneurship. And we know that um, uh, particularly around um, Black um, uh, and uh, women and women of color, and we know that um, um, Black women are one of the fastest growing um, segments of entrepreneurs. I think there was an article that said 17% are in the process of starting or running a business in comparison to 10% of their white counterparts. The study, and it was in Harvard Business Review, went on to say that the fact that there must be that they're the high um, black women make up the most entrepreneurs might be because they are exhausted both mentally and um, emotionally due to the fact that they often are asked to work 30 to 40 percent harder um, than their white male and female counterparts to get the same results in a corporate environment. So I would love for you to comment on that and to share, you know, how can we and the, and the individuals help be better supporters and, and advocates for Black entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs of colors and leaders within our own organizations? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so just a little bit of context. So the Coleman Foundation um, was started by Dorothy and Stetson Coleman, who lived in the northern suburbs here outside of Chicago. And um, they started the Fannie Mae Candy Company. For those of y'all that know Fannie Mae Candy, I grew up eating Fannie Mae Candy and, and also giving it to my teachers for Christmas. Um, and, uh, and really, it was a women-owned business. So, we, so our roots are in entrepreneurship. Uh, so Dorothy was the, was the lead founder of that company, and so that's where our, that's where the origins of our corpus come from is through through that family wealth and then through the sale the ultimate sale of the business. So entrepreneurship is in Coleman Foundation's DNA and roots. For many decades, um, our focus was on seeding entrepreneurship in colleges and universities. So seeding the field of entrepreneurship education at the undergraduate, graduate, and postgraduate levels. And so there are Coleman Foundation um, academics that had postdoctorate education. There are also students in undergraduate universities scattered throughout the Midwest that have been able to learn about entrepreneurship studies in colleges and universities. We've gotten to the point now where that, that field is really ripe and mature and there are folks all over the country that, that can access entrepreneurship education in a formalized sense, again, before the MBA. So colleges, um, uh, undergrad and graduate studies. So then um, over the past handful of years, the Coleman Foundation then decided, okay, what's next? And this is before my time. I've been in place as CEO for about 18 months. So we decided to pivot to what the what the other need was, was really what do we do with those possibly without formalized education that have ideas or are starting their own businesses in their neighborhoods already or may start with an additional business, right? Like so they have a day job and then they have, some people would call it a side hustle, some people call it an informal business. How do we help move from that idea stage or that informal business to then formalized business to then... Um, being self-employed and possibly um, employing others as an opportunity to build wealth and stabilize communities, particularly low and moderate income communities, which means black, um, black and Latino communities in Chicago South and, and West Side and, and also immigrant communities North Side. So that's, so that's where that comes from. And it's really exciting because we know that these businesses are needed um, that these that these um, communities and neighbors have been decades long ignored by economic development opportunities, and we know when these when these businesses thrive, blocks are more stable and safe, and, and neighborhoods are more stable and safe, and people need still to be able to shop in goods and services in their own communities and be able to be and youth need employment opportunities in their communities. So there are just many opportunities when we think about neighborhood-based entrepreneurship. That, that, I, that is one of the reasons that I came to the YWCA is because um, 
we support a lot of micro entrepreneurs in um, the family child care. And that is predominantly um, almost exclusively women entrepreneurs and um, over 60% are women of color entrepreneurs who are doing child care out of their home. And, and they are doing, we saw during the pandemic, the service that they were providing to allow essential workers and people to continue to work. So um, thank you for the work that you're doing in Coleman Foundation to support that. It's so needed in communities. To be happy to do that, of course, and, and just so everybody caught it, full disclosure, the Coleman Foundation is one of the one of the um, donors to the entrepreneurship work at the YWCA. Thanks. So, Amy, I would like to um, ask you, given that there um, is a lack of equitable attitudes towards girls and women are so entrenched across the board. We see that both in the developing countries and some less developed countries. What do you think is the role for organizations that work in the space to truly live into the values and vision of equality for and equity for girls and women? Yeah, I think, thanks for your question. I think that this, this gets to sort of the heart of, of, of our work um, you know, when I first uh, got involved in, in girls' education, thinking about uh, scholarships and things that girls need, but um, it's really a very complicated issue uh, why girls aren't attending and, and succeeding in school. And, and it doesn't just mean um, uh, necessarily related to education, but changing these gender attitudes in favor of women's rights and gender equality as, as, as you're pointing out. So two things um, I wanted to point out that we've learned in doing, in doing this work um, is number one, really the importance of partnering with uh, local community leaders in the design and implementation of the work can really not be overstated. Because if you're, if, you're, if you're going into change minds and attitudes, uh, me coming in from the outside uh, would never be successful in, in that regard. Um, and then the second thing would be, um, you know, because there's such complex issues related to girls' education, sort of taking this holistic approach um, that takes into account uh, the long-term shift in gender attitudes and norms. So, so to the first point, um, working with local leaders, uh, particularly women uh, leaders, is crucial to, to the work. Um, working with respected local leaders to ensure their projects um, that we do are tailored to and driven by the communities that we serve. And, you know, um, our, our model for development is a little bit different than the traditional 40 years of development with, you think of massive dam projects or building wells and distributing sacks of rice. Um, we know a lot of those projects are, are unsuccessful, do not work. Um, little change for people in, in rural villages. Um, so, so what we do at Women's Global is something very different. We don't sit here in Chicago um, and decide priorities and sort of staff up projects and, and roll out um, activities and interventions in rural Africa. That, that doesn't work. Um, in order to improve and change the lives of people, we need to equip local leaders and partners living in those communities um, so that it takes uh, into account uh, uh, all of the issues um, and get set that gender um, shift. So to the second point, I just wanted to point out that because there are so many issues related to girls' education, sort of this 360 degree approach is needed. Um, it's not just about scholarships or building schools. I, I wish it were, it would be a lot simpler uh, if we could just solve everything with that. Um, but the solution really needs to take into account this entire community, the parents, the teachers, religious leaders, boys, girls, in order to get at changing those underlying attitudes um, about girls and girls' education. And so in our programs, um, because there are so many reasons why girls are, are dropping out of school, we, we have these inter, um, interdisciplinary um, sort of strategies that get at that. So for an example, if a girl does receive a scholarship to access secondary school, it's coupled with counseling and community meetings with her parents on the importance of girls' education. Um, things like early marriage and early pregnancy, we provide, of course, intensive workshops on reproductive health, um, gender-based violence, and family planning. Um, we we have offer after-school clubs for boys and girls 
to talk about gender stereotypes and again, the importance of education. Um, and so we recognize that this cultural shift um, will take time. You know, this is not an easy <laughs> uh, uh, um, uh, matter. Uh, education and improving the lives of women and girls is really a long-term project. Um, but in the end, uh, the ultimate goal is to change those minds and attitudes that we don't need scholarships. Girls are, parents are sending their kids to school um, on their own. Thanks. Um, when you were talking, I, I know I'm going to butcher it, but there is a saying that says something about what is um, not done with us is done to us. And that's what's resonated to me when you talk about your approach of really involving the local leaders in what they need. And I love your approach um, of, of taking the family approach that's very similar and rooted in some of the work that I'm familiar with from the early, early childhood uh, field of the whole child and the, the family, some of the Head Start, where it's not only about the child, but it's their family, it's the community in which they live. And um, I think that that's where you're really in it for the long haul and you're making those really systemic and, and changes in one community at a time. Thank you, exactly. That's great, that's great. So Adrian, I wanna pivot a little bit. I wanna hear a little bit, if you could tell us about some of your research that you're doing around DSTEM equity model. Um, and specifically, if you wanna tell us a little bit about your research and how it relates to helping to eliminate barriers and, um, and motivators for really um, Black and uh, Latinx students to be more involved in STEM and STEM learning. Sure. Um First, I want to share uh, just a little bit of data. So if you look at, at the STEM pathway and careers, you'll see that it's 50% women and 50% male, right? And so a lot of people will think it's pretty equitable. But when you dig a little bit deeper into the actual careers, what you see is an overrepresentation of females in life sciences and social sciences and an underrepresentation of females in computer science, engineering, and mathematics, right? So uh, a, a lot of my research is addressing those STEM inequities. And then when you look at it from a racial perspective, you have fewer than 7% of Black and Latino STEM professionals. And when you go a little bit deeper and you dig into engineering and mathematics, you have fewer than 2% of professionals who are Black and Latino females. So I wanted to um, provide just a bit of context. And so, you know, reason being, a lot of the literature has told us um, that, you know, well, STEM is too challenging for these particular populations. They're not interested in STEM. This is nothing that they, they want to do. And that narrative that's been put forth and society and professional literature in the media is so um, one-sided and a very narrow view. Um, and it's just not the, the total truth. And so I work at the Illinois Mathematics and Science Academy, and I'm working with some young, brilliant minds, females, Blacks, Latinos. And so I sought out to change the narrative that has been put forth in the professional literature and to share a different perspective and a, a truthful perspective because I'm working with these young, brilliant minds. And so the DSTEM equity model came out of some research that I've done um, on, specifically with Black and Latino students to address the STEM inequities that exist. And so part of the model talks about the systemic problem. And we have to begin to look at these, it, these issues on a systemic level, beyond the individual, beyond the institutional level, um, and from really that societal um, perspective. And so when you look at the systemic problem, you find that there's a vision gap. You know, Blacks and Latinos, females, they don't see those that look like themselves represented in STEM fields, and thus it's very difficult for them to develop a vision of going into STEM for themselves. There's definitely an opportunity gap where, you know, either due to, you know, racism or economic issues, um, you know, Blacks and Latinos don't necessarily have the opportunities to engage um, in STEM outside of the school day, right? So they are, they're not engaged in summer programs and after school programs. Then there's this cultural perception gap, which I talked about um, briefly, in which others do not think they are capable 
of engaging in such rigorous coursework. Um, next, you have the STEM education gap. And when you think about the, 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 the funding in schools, um, it's not always equitable. Um, even though here in the state of Illinois, um, we, are, we're, we have a formula now that's created more equity. But if you look at funding across the nation, there is an equitable funding based on socioeconomic status. And what we see is that students are not being introduced to laboratory science. Students are not being able to go through the entire um, high school sequence of mathematics, which prevents them from actually entering a STEM field or, or makes it a lot more difficult to enter a STEM field. Then there's this sort of generational gap in which parents, because they're not engaged in STEM, because they don't necessarily um, understand you know, the, the STEM space, they're not able to assist their students in the STEM um, process, right? Um, and then the final sort of gap I'm going to talk about is the identification gap, because we are not seeing the talent and potential in our girls, in our Black and Latino students, because it shows up differently, right? And That leads me to kind of my next section where I'm gonna talk a little bit about STEM motivation. First, we need um, early STEM exposure and I'm talking about pre-K. Then we need culturally responsive STEM pedagogy, right? And um, when, when you think about it in terms of through a female lens, what that potentially looks like is use, it's the use of chemistry right, to develop skin care and hair care products. It's the use of mathematics to understand our hairstyles, right, and the geometry behind it. It's the use of mathematics to understand music and engage in music, right? So being culturally responsive and, and being culturally responsive also means assisting students in solving the problems of the world, the problems that they are interested in solving and using the scientific process to do that and guide that. Next, we, we, we have to have conversations on race. My experience as a Black woman is very different than, Shelly, your experience as a white woman. And we have to talk about that, right? We can talk about girls' education and coming together and being collaborative. I think that's phenomenal. But we also talk, have to talk about the other identities and the impact of those identities in terms of education, right? So conversations on, on race is an important part of this model. We need to have personalized assessments and evaluations, meaning educators, you need to know your students. You need to understand what motivates them, what drives them. You need to provide them with evaluations, right, that are actually developed personally for them. All, everyone learns differently. Right, some some students they're great at taking you know tests. Some students they're great at projects and oral presentations. So allow your students to be evaluated in the way that best fits them. So again, knowledge of students is very important. And finally, um, you have to have some STEM leadership development. We have to provide our students with leadership skills and give them the opportunity to lead inside and outside of the classroom. And I know I'm going a little bit long here, so I'm going to just close it out with, if we truly want to bridge the racial STEM divide, we have to have policy that drives this. We have to have a village that is focused on this. And when I talk about that village, I'm talking about STEM educators, um, STEM professionals, community organizations, parents, everyone coming together and working on these students' behalf. And finally, every single educator, every single one, needs to go through culturally responsive pedagogy training. Thank you so much for allowing me to um, share my DSTEM equity model with you all this morning.
Thanks, Adrian. I know we share a, um, a mutual friend um, that um, has really, she has been a mentor to me in how important that culturally competent curriculum is for STEM education. I've learned so much and I know she's learned from you in that regard. <laughs> Um, so she's definitely playing it forward because I, I see that when I go to some of the programs that we have at the Y, such as our tech girls, I see when you can tap into what is relevant for those girls and, and, and they're able to solve real world problems. Um, and um, it's just amazing. And when you unleash that potential in them. So thanks for the work you're doing and thanks for sharing that model. Thank you. Marunwa, I would love to um, to circle back to you. I know that you are a, a motivational speaker, so you part of that as as being a motivational speaker, you really help girls unleash their dreams. So, what advice do you have for all of us who work with girls? Um, how do we set the stage to really help them fulfill their dreams and 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 really support them? Thank you so much uh, for that question. Um, you know, my, my experience with girls, uh, particularly in South Africa and in Zimbabwe, having uh, done a site visit in 2020, is that there is a lot of lost hope. Um, girls, uh, I mean, when I was, we, we were having our first meeting of the ACFF with the uh, president, he shared with us that some of the girls that we were sponsoring uh, through some of the help of the American organizations have actually dropped out uh, because they have fallen pregnant. And, um, and, and it's because they see marriage as their only hope towards them achieving life. And, and if you look at the poverty that surrounds them, it, it only makes sense. So when you're working with girls, I think we, we need to give them hope. We need to make them aware that we are aware of your situation. But remember that your situation does not define who you are. Your situation does not define the type of person that you can become. You can, in fact, rise above the challenges that you are experiencing right now as a girl child and become a leader. And one of the things that we can use is examples of um, many great women leaders, uh, for example, Michelle Obama, for example, Oprah Winfrey, whom I have referred to uh, in my first book, uh, When is Enough Enough? 10 Things in Aspiring Entrepreneur Needs to Know to Start and Run a Successful Business. Um, Winima Dikizela Mandela from South Africa, Margaret Thatcher. There are a lot of um, great women who have actually made it. Um, Roland Jenkins, who has written, um, you know, these movies about Harry Potter. Um, I give examples about how many times she was rejected until such time that uh, just she was given a chance. And when she was given a chance, she blossomed and she became successful. So we need to demonstrate to girls that and I guess it's the same message that we can give to boys, but we need to differentiate for the girls because, you know, when you have a girl as a leader, they say when you want something done, get a woman to do it. So we need to make girls become aware that they actually have the power within themselves to achieve, to become who they are. But what we also need to be cautious of is to not make it seem that it is easy. We need to be realistic and say to them, you are going to encounter challenges, you are going to meet setbacks, you are going to face roadblocks, and you will definitely experience tragedy. And I mean, with what has happened with COVID recently, we have lost a lot of people. We have lost a lot of women leaders. And that obviously impacts on every girl's child in terms of when they look in their village, when they look in their township and they see that they have lost so many people whom they were looking upon it makes them lose hope. So we must not uh, beat about the bush and make it seem that it's easy and that they're not going to experience challenges. Definitely they are going to experience challenges and we need to be realistic, but we need to give them hope because it is doable if you believe it. I think that's so important um, to make sure that we're inspiring that that hope and 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 um, and and it pains me when I hear that um, the lost hope during some of what people have been through. Um, 
um, the last, but I think that's uh, an important um, to keep in mind. How do we continue to all of us inspire hope? Well, I could talk to this group of individuals, this this powerhouse of women all day long, but I want to just um, uh, close out the panel um, by just asking if, and I'll start with you, Adrienne, and then um, we'll just go down. If you could share your final thought. Um, for this, for the group of, of individuals, and and most of the people who join our education conference every year are educators. They're advocates for women and girls, and passionate. Can you share some final thoughts? Um, and we'll go through everybody to share their final thought with the group. Adrienne, we'll kick it off with you. Sure, I, I would just say in education, the the best way to really work with each of your students is getting to know who they are letting them know that you are genuinely concerned about them and their lives and not always just their academic success, right? It's loving your students for who they are, understanding where they come from and where they are in life um, and making sure that that shows up in the curriculum. I love that. And um, I think back today when about some of the teachers who inspired me and Mrs. Frank comes to mind and she was one of the my she was my third grade teacher and I was a horrible speller. And she saw me for who I was and really um, fostered in me a passion for creative writing that you wouldn't think because I wasn't that um, I wasn't that language kid. Um, so she really got to know me. And so I think that's such a valuable and, and she reminds me a lot um, of that. I always think about her and that piece. Shelly, will you share with us your final thoughts? Thanks, Shelly. This, first of all, this was amazing. Thank you for for. Stanley for in inviting me, Shelley for moderating and everybody else for your words. Um, I, my heart is heavy because if you have not seen the breaking news here um, in the U.S., I, I recognize this as an international audience, but um, Roe v. Wade, which is the Supreme Court decision that protected women's rights to terminate pregnancy was just overturned. And although we've been waiting for this for several weeks, I still feel sick um, and livid, um, and and so and I and I raise that because it's now it's happening. But I also raise it in light of the video that we started with. So when women and girls don't have full control over their bodies and their health, there is there is nothing left, right? Like their their future could be predetermined in a way that is beyond their control. So, um, so I think that, you know, in terms of health and economics and agency and education, these are all interlinked. And I don't wanna lose sight of that when only thinking about what happens to girls in the classroom, but what happens to girls in their families and what happens to girls in society and ultimately what happens to girls and women in their future. So I will, I will leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, Shelley. Amy. Yeah, I, I share uh, Shelley's anger uh, about the news, um, but I am gonna I'm gonna try to leave on a on a, on a hopeful note here that uh, I do believe gender equality can be achieved, and it's 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 all of you that are inspiring me right now um, on this panel. All of the work that you're doing to drive that change, uh, it whether it's you know domestically or internationally, all of us are are lifting girls up. Um, and we know that when one girl succeeds, we all succeed. And uh, I think that um, it's time for every girl, regardless of her circumstance, to, to, um, to decide for herself her own future. Education gives you that as long as you, you, you look at the whole, the whole, the whole child. Um, and I think that this conference is already part of the solution. Um, this is about women taking charge and sort of leading the way for other women around the world. And I think we have the expertise and the, uh, the money and the drive to just to do that. So thank you for inspiring me to, to keep this work going. Thanks, Amy. Marunwa. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my parting words is that um, be the candle that lights up someone's darkness. And I say that because, and I would like to echo the words of every speaker, Shelley, um, Adrian and, and Amy, 
Um, it really is sad what is happening in the country. And, you know, when I went with Stanley to go to the Mosina village in Zimbabwe in January 2020, my eyes were actually opened at the level of poverty that is in Africa. And until we go down there and then we see the living conditions of people, is then that we are going to be able to make a difference. So ladies, you know that uh, when you put women together, things happen. So let's get together and make things happen. Thank you so much for making me part of this auspicious event. Thank you. Jen? Sure. Um, thank you to everyone who just commented. I, I, uh, I kind of second all of that. Um, it, you know, I, I'm hearing throughout and just listening to all the wonderful work that these wonderful women are doing that obviously there are multiple ways to go at this and every way is moving us forward. And so um, continuing on with your part, we can't, to look at the whole picture can be somewhat overwhelming, especially as Shelley indicated, what's happening right now feels a little bit, well, feels a lot like we've just gone back so much. But we must continue to move forward and inspire the younger people and those around us and be inspired by those around us. I am certainly inspired by what I heard today. And I'm, I am also hopeful and optimistic. I'm also really angry and that'll motivate me too, moving forward with what's going on here. But I think, you know, staying focused on the child, the goal and each other and actually, you know, getting, getting, um, feeling that support from each other, I think is very important. So bringing us together like this today, I thank you very much for that opportunity. And I think we should keep doing these kinds of events. Thanks, Jen. I just wanna echo, um, uh, like everybody else, I, I am angry, I am sad. I uh, was telling our panelists before that this past Saturday I became a grandma and it is unfathomable to me that she will grow up in a world that has less reproductive rights than her mother and I had. And so like Jen, um, I'm a fighter and um, this has motivated me. You guys have given me on a very dark day uh, with the announcement, motivation to continue to forge forward. And it just shows us when you bring a good group, I think um, it, it was mentioned that when you bring a group of women together and a group of leaders who are passionate about this, anything can happen. And so I think we're at that crossroads in our country and I'm just so excited excited to have um, this panel and our speakers today that are doing this work. So thank you and thank you, Stanley, for letting us be a part of this. And I'll turn it back to you. Uh, so we're just going to play our last video and then we'll give the final remarks. Uh, Jocelyn. Um, okay. My name is Ndaka Ziva Murauba. I am one of the beneficiaries of ACFE program in Zimbabwe. I am so happy that I passed my O levels and I hope to move on and get a job for my children and to look after my family and my children. Uh, I am a married woman with three kids. Without school, life was not easy for me. Uh, I worked so hard to feed my children and look after the family, but the life was not easy without school. In Zimbabwe, life without school is not easy. So I trying to make ends meet, and I told you from morning to eve, trying to make ends meet, but life was not easy. Luckily and lastly, I find a help from the ACFE, which gives me scholarship, stationery, books and uniforms that gave me a hope for the future and I passed my own levels. Feeding program was so important for us as we come very far with the empty stomachs to school. Stationery and the school shoes and the uniforms was so very important because it gives us confidence and the shoes are so important as we come very far we walk long distances. Now that I have passed my O levels, <coughs> I wish to go to Polytechnic College and do electrical engineering and got a professional job and earn a living and look after my children and my family.
Uh, Dennis, uh, you can start um, and we can conclude on our remarks. Thank you, Stanley. And thank you to all of our wonderful panelists and thanks to all of the, um, all of the participants who joined us for this incredible uh, program this morning on this very um, important and, and sad day. Um, I also want to just congratulate you, Stanley, on uh, the fourth annual Girls Education uh, Conference. It's been a pleasure to work with you throughout these uh, past four years. And uh, congratulations on all the work that the African Community Fund for Education uh, undertakes. And again, we look forward to welcoming you back to Chicago as an International House uh, graduate fellow here at the International House at the University of Chicago. Thank you, Stanley. Uh, thank you, Dennis, and uh, thank you to the YWCA, to the CGH for your partnership, um, and to Shelley for always being the best moderator of our panel conversations, and for all the speakers who uh, contributed to the, today's event. Um, so I really hope thank you for your participation in our fourth annual education, Girls Education Conference. Uh, we encourage you to visit our websites at www.acfegroup.org and at ihouse.uchicago.edu and you can find ways in which you can get involved. Thank you and see you again next time.